The word arsenic comes from the Greek word arsenikin, which means potent. An arsenic is a naturally occurring element found in rocks, soil, water, and air. It's also a byproduct of mining. And historically, it's had many uses. It's been used in agriculture as a preservative and an insecticide. It's been used for pigments in paints, wallpapers, and ceramics. And it has been used for cosmetic purposes. Doctors have prescribed it for the treatment of skin conditions such as psoriasis. It was an effective treatment for syphilis before penicillin. But it has had more sinister uses also, such as poisoning other people, like your lazy husband or nagging wife or pesky neighbors. For decades, it was considered the perfect poison due to it being odorless and almost tasteless. It used to be easily obtained. You could just pick up an inexpensive box of rat poison at the pharmacy. While it can cause long, slow, painful deaths, it's very hard to detect in the body. And the symptoms experienced by someone who had been poisoned look very similar to many common illnesses. An upset stomach vomiting, and headaches. And unless there was a reason to be suspicious, no one ever checked for it. Things are a bit different today, though. Arsenic is no longer an ingredient in rat poisoning. Most places have strict regulations for it. And with modern advances in science, it can easily be detected in almost all cases when tested. Thankfully, it's not as easy to get away with poisoning someone as it used to be. Good afternoon. Hey. I'm just going to jump right into this story okay. since it is the second one that we're recording today. All right. Okay. Janie Hickox was born on Christmas Day in 1932. Now... Later in the years, it was said that she was favored by her mother. She did have siblings. And um, I thought, well, you know, maybe by having that little Christmas Day baby born, yes. maybe it was a special gift to her. And maybe she did favor her. I don't know. But, you know, a Christmas Day baby would be special. Yes. But I don't favor kids. No, me either. <laughs> anyway, so Janie grows up. And as a teenager, she marries Charles Gibbs around sometime around 1947 or 1948. So she was a teenager, around 15 or 16. Okay. I had read that she was 17 when she married, but I actually did the math and uh, that she would have had to have been 16 or younger. Oh, okay. Young bride. So Charles was from Florida, but they set up house in Cordell, Georgia. And soon after that, they had their first son, Roger, in 1948. And then they went on to have two more sons, Melvin and Marvin. Charles, he worked as an electrician at times and an appliance uh, repairman. Okay. And Janie was a stay-at-home mom, and she actually ran a home daycare. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And they were a religious family. They were members of Pleasant Grove Baptist Church right there in town, where Charles was actually on the board of deacons, and Janie was a Sunday school teacher. So I don't know a lot about their early life when their family was young, but when their boys were teenagers— in late January of 1966, the husband, Charles, he uh, suddenly got very sick mm -hmm. and he was taken to Cordell Hospital. Nothing they could do for Charles helped him. And he just died very suddenly on January the 21st. His cause of death was listed as a heart attack. And that was really surprising because he was only 39 years old. Oh, wow. At the time. Yeah, yeah. that's young. Yeah, I mean, they still had young teenagers at, in the home as well. Mm. But it is always a surprise when somebody that young dies from a heart yes. attack. I mean, we know it can happen, but it's just... It and does, it's rare. It's rare. So Charles was buried on January 23rd in 1966 in the Sunnyside Cemetery with his pastor, the Reverend Jack Dowdy, officiating. Well, seven months later... Charles and Janie's 13-year-old son, Marvin, came down with a mysterious illness. Oh. 
Oh, I think I know where this is going. Yeah. He was taken to America's hospital where he eventually succumbed to his illness. Mm. And sadly, just a few days later, he passed away. 13. 13 years old. The obituary said it was a lengthy illness, but I don't really think it was that lengthy. Okay. It is interesting that he had recently won a physical fitness award at school just before he became sick. So, he and they don't know. They, so, there's no, like, they don't know what he was sick from. Well, they listed his cause of death as vir- virulent hepatitis. Okay. So, it was a stomach uh, issues, that kind of thing. Okay. He, too, was buried in the Sunnyside Cemetery uh, with the Reverend Jack Dowdy presiding over mm-hmm. his funeral as well. So as if, you know, the loss of her husband and now her 13-year-old son was not... That would be devastating. Devastating. That's that's a lot of grief to have to carry. But only five months after Marvin's death, Janie's 16-year-old son, Melvin, became mysteriously ill. Uh. He was taken to America's Hospital, too. And sadly, just a couple of days later, he took his last breath. That's awful. Just five months after his brother and almost one year to the day of his father's early death. And Melvin's cause of death was listed as a rare muscular disease. Are the people not getting suspicious yet? Well, you would think they would be, wouldn't you? Yes. But people were thinking maybe it was a hereditary illness that they Um, had. Maybe it was a hereditary liver problem. Okay. And it was actually became known around the community that those Gibbs fellas just were they they had some kind of a gene that just made them unhealthy. I mean, I could understand if they all like, OK, say they all died at 39, right. you know, 38 or 39, but 13, 16 and 39. That doesn't make sense to me. Right. Yeah. So once again, Janie found herself burying a loved one in the Sunnyside Cemetery And once again, her faithful pastor, Reverend Jack Dowdy, was there to officiate the services. And just like you said, weren't people getting suspicious? Right. I would think he would have been wondering, like, what's up here? And maybe he was just wondering, okay, how do I minister to this poor woman who's had so much loss in this short space of time? I'm not sure yet if he was suspicious. And when you know somebody, you think... There's no way they would, you know what I mean? Right. You don't let yourself go there usually. This was a solid family in his church. Right. So you kind of do explain things away, mm-hmm. I think, when you know someone. I agree. So around this time, J- Charles and Janie's oldest son, 19-year-old Roger, and his girlfriend, Jeanette Foster, found out they were pregnant. Oh. Yeah. So finally, a speck of joy. Right. In the midst of so much loss. And I read somewhere that they were living with Janie during this time. Uh I'm sure with him being only 19 and her having lost already two sons and a husband, maybe they were just trying to help her out and themselves as well. And I can only imagine when that little baby boy, Ronnie Edward Gibbs, was born in September of 1967, how much of a healing bomb that was for that family. Yeah, that would have been special. Yeah, I can also only imagine how shell-shocked his parents were when at just five weeks old, their little baby oh, heck no. passed away. Oh my gosh, no. Very unexpectedly. Well, does this lady have insurance policies on all these people? Yes. Okay. We'll talk about that. Okay. I'm sure that those parents had to be wondering what in the world is going on. Yes. Was there something hereditary really causing the deaths? Because, or, I mean, I wonder if or, the son started to question his mom. I I wonder if yeah. he did. I mean, I would even be thinking, okay, if if I really truly didn't think it was her, yeah. I'd be thinking, okay, is there something in our water? Right. Something right. environmental causing yes. this? The ba- newborn baby? Or maybe there's just a family curse. Who knows? But once again... This distraught family had to hold another funeral at Sunnyside Cemetery, and the family's pastor officiated. At this point, I don't even know what a pastor could say that would be remotely comforting to this family. Me either. Especially that poor brother. Now he's the one I actually feel sorry for. Right. 
Roger. Well, when that when little baby Ronnie died, and they took a, a tissue specimen from the baby's body, and they sent it to Emory University pathologist. So that was sent off. Okay. To be tested, and it was a baffling case. Does it take some time for that for that to come back? Yeah, a little okay. bit. Now, I feel like there's only so much grief a person can handle. And yes. to me, that's just overload. I don't think anybody really could could live through, that. live through that. But there are reports that people in Janie's church said she stood up under that grief more than anybody could have expected her to. Hmm. But I honestly cannot fathom how Roger's wife, Jeanette, could handle it because She's now lost her baby son. Yes. And just three weeks later, Roger becomes sick. Oh, my gosh. And he passes away. Oh, my gosh. That had to be devastating for her. Okay. This is just getting weird. Yeah. And you would think... Please tell me that people started questioning (laughs) this lady. Yes. You would think it would be devastating for Janie if... She's losing all these people. And now right. her ver- her own, her last son, like all three of her sons now have died under mysterious illnesses and her husband. And now her first grandchild, even even his obituary said that he was the fifth person in his immediate family to die within two years. I agree with you. Surely at this point, even people reading yes. that obituary would think, well, that's it's very odd. suspicious. Uh huh. Yeah. Jeanette was. And so were the doctors. Okay. And so they did an autopsy on Roger. And they found large amounts of arsenic in Roger's body. Surprise, surprise. Actually, the reports stated several milligrams were found. Obviously, doctors then did contact authorities. Obviously, authorities, they have to question who's the common denominator here that's living in the same house and hasn't gotten mysteriously sick right right? and if i was jeanette i would get out of that house pretty doggone quick oh i know is she still there i don't i don't know at that i mean i believe she and roger were still living in the home with with janie when he died i'm sure that after that she left Mm -hmm. so the the authorities at this point they do know janie has to have some knowledge of what's happening During an interview, just after Roger died, you know, she was being interviewed by the media, and she told one newspaper reporter, Janie said, I don't question God's work. The Bible says they will get their reward, and I'm sure they will. Yeah, and she's going to get her reward, too. Yeah. So on December 23rd, 1967, just two days before Christmas and Janie's 35th birthday, she was arrested and charged with the murder of her son, Roger Ludine Gibbs. While sitting in jail in Vienna, she told interviewers that this would be the loneliest Christmas I've ever spent, and birthday too. That's who she's worried about is her. Mm -hmm. Authorities now want to exhume the bodies of Janie's other sons and her husband. So they got a court order for that, and it stated that at least three family members had died under unusual and suspicious circumstances, and that foul play was suspected. Mm. Have they got the pathology report back from the baby? Well, actually, what happened was when once Roger died, uh-huh. they took that pathology report or that specimen, mm-hmm. and they sent it to authorities as well. Oh, okay. So now they are... Um, Yes, now they have it and they're testing it. Okay. On December 27th, the exhumations began with Melvin first, then husband Charles, and lastly Marvin, Marvin's body. They actually spread tents along the ground right alongside the graves, and they performed the autopsies on site at the cemetery as the bodies were brought up. Wow. Each one took about 45 minutes. The body of baby Ronnie didn't have to be exhumed because they already had that tissue specimen that they had gotten during mm-hmm. the autopsy. So they were able to let the baby lie peacefully without right. without bringing him back up. Now, I want to remind you that Janie had also been a home daycare provider for around 25 children. Oh, Lord. During one interview, she stated she just naturally loved children. She didn't know what she would do without them. And people trusted her. 
One local law enforcement's wife said that Mrs. Gibbs had just recently babysat her child before all this happened. Goodness. Okay. Did any of those kids come up Miss Center? I mean, come up, Dad? No. Okay. No. Thankfully. Well, probably because it was insurance motivated. Probably. But we will talk about that insurance okay. in a minute. And you'll have to see if you still believe that. Okay. Several church members cried when they heard that she had been arrested. The Reverend Jack Dowdy's wife was shocked to hear of the arrest. And then when she was uh, asked about Janie, she described her as a wonderful person, very kind and considerate, a devoted mother, a Christian as she knew her. People can fool you. They can, for for real. Mm -hmm. Janie remained jailed through the end of 1967. And in the early days of 1968, while legal proceedings in the deaths of her family were progressing, she was still incarcerated. Her defense had managed to get her a psychiatric evaluation, and the prosecution did have autopsy results, but they were keeping those under wraps until she was ordered to stand trial. In February of that year, during a hearing, her defense team elicited testimony that that psychiatric evaluation had deemed her schizophrenic. The doctor testified that this type of schizophrenia was split personality and reality distortion. She had admitted during that evaluation that she had given Roger poison, but she also claimed she did not think he was dead. Huh? She says she didn't think he was dead. I believe she's trying to play tricks. You think so? Yes. She also admitted that she had given the arsenic to her other family members. Hmm. But the psychiatrist could find no motive for the killings, and Janie didn't really give them one. So that life insurance. Yes. So she did receive life insurance in about in the amount of $31,000. But her defense says that was not a, a reliable motive because the insurance on her husband was only for $1,000, and she had to use that for his funeral. And then the other three sons, it was a $10,000 policy each. And she apparently tithed off of that money and then kept the rest, but was really spending it for her legal cost. So, I mean, yeah, she's spending it for a legal cost now. Right. But, but she, before that, well, they just said it wasn't enough. Like she didn't have thousands, hundred hundreds thousand, of thousands of dollars. That 10000 each was not really a motive to kill your own children. I mean, you would think not, but we've seen worse, haven't yeah, we? Yes. Well, at that hearing, she was actually declared insane and unfit to stand trial. Even though she could fool everybody at church and live her life. just Yeah. and But she's schizophrenic when yeah. she gets in front of a psychiatrist. Right. I'm glad you said that because we're going to we're going to talk about that, too, about fooling everybody at church. Janie was then confined instead of going to stand trial and being, you know, confined to jail. She was confined to a mental institution. Central State Hospital in Milledgeville, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation escorted her there. And while there, it is reported that she worked as a cook. (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) that's uh, interesting. Somebody probably should have told them. Like, I'm thinking maybe before you put somebody in that position, you ought to know what they're in for. Yes. So, isn't that crazy? That is. The pathology results were were revealed. After she was deemed not worthy, not not mentally fit to stand trial. And so it was reported in the paper that all five bodies of the victims were later determined to contain lethal amounts of arsenic. Now, back to that life insurance for a second. One of the policies didn't want to pay off because okay. now obviously she's being, you know, uh, accused of murder. Sure. But in November of 1969... Her brother, who was also her guardian, not that she's living with him, but he's kind of like over her affairs. Yeah. He filed suit against that insurance company to get the proceeds, the proceeds from it. And he won that case. And so he was awarded $10,000 of life insurance by the jury. I didn't think you could get life insurance if they were murdered. Well, he was able to sue them and get it. That's crazy. I know. Also, while she was confined in the hospital, she met someone special. There was a man in the veterans ward that she became friends with. They met at a dance, and they became more than friends. 
Oh, he, dang it. It's at the, jail, at the, at the hospital. mental hospital. Gracious. And he apparently gave her a ring of some sort. And then eventually during that, during those years, she was moved back to Cordell to the jail. Mm-hmm. And so while she was in there, he went to visit her on numerous occasions. Wow. But finally, in June of 1974, she was declared sane. I guess she had recovered from her schizophrenia. She was ordered to stand trial for the Good. murder of Roger. Good. And then the case actually goes through like an intense legal tangle involving right. several motions and uh, moves to suppress and even an appeal to the state Supreme Court. It took over two years to work its way through all of those things before it finally was settled that she would stand trial for the killing now of not just Roger, but the other members of her family. Oh, good. But did they try or s- hopefully they're going to do that separately? It was one trial, but she was charged with all five. I wish they hadn't done that. Well, by the end of 1976, of April of 1976, after eight years of being in a mental institution and then partly jail, because Uh some of that time she had to spend in jail when they were moving those legal proceedings. Right. But finally, the trial did begin. The trial lasted for four days. And at least 32 witnesses testified. Part of her defense was that she had developed schizophrenia after being treated for an illness in 1961. The testimony claimed that the drugs she was taking for the illness played a part in her mental condition. What do you think about that? I mean, the only the only weird thing is that she did wait like a long time. You know, her like it was like they were 13 and 16 and 19 And she had been married for a long time. So it doesn't seem like before that. That she had any issues. That she had those issues. But but I don't think she was insane because she was able to, um, you know, just like fool everybody. Glad you said that. Mm -hmm. I don't think she was. I don't think she was. Okay. So whether she was insane or not, I still think that she was responsible for what she did. Like, I think she knew at the time when she was poisoning them that it was wrong. There was a chaplain that visited her at the mental institution, Uh and he came out and said that he felt like she was mentally capable to stand trial, that she did know right from wrong. Okay. And that she should be charged with the murders. Okay. Yeah. That's what I agree with. Well, one of the witnesses that the prosecution called was her sister, Miss Helen Williams, Mm -hmm. and she stated they had lived a normal childhood. They weren't wealthy, but they were well taken care of. And um, that's when she said that Janie had been their mother's favorite for whatever that meant. But she also said there was just nothing in their childhood that would have contributed to a mental break. Okay. And was she showing a mental break and were there cracks showing in any other area besides she just secretly murdering her family? Well, there was one witness during the trial. Okay. That really will make you raise some eyebrows. I'm going to come to that. I'm going to move on down, but I am going to address that for you. I'm going to answer that question for you. All right. So her whole defense said that the life insurance was not a motive. She didn't have a motive. It was just a mental thing. That was the whole defense. Mm -hmm. Well, on May 9th, 1976, after 11 hours of deliberation, a jury of seven men and five women found Janie Lou Gibbs Guilty. And the judge gave her five life sentences Good for each member of the family. He said, these are consecutive sentences because you consecutively killed each member of your family. She stood straight and emotionless while the judge handed down her sentences. Once the proceedings were over, her brother, that's her guardian, Mm -hmm. he ushered her into a private room And while they were going, the press was trying to ask her for comment, and he wouldn't let them speak to her, and he shut the door in their faces before she could respond. But one juror did come forward, remaining anonymous, Uh and they said that the deciding factor of whether they found her guilty or not came down to the testimony of a social worker named Josie Green. Josie had actually placed two foster children in the care of Charles and Janie, during the time that this poisoning was being administered to her family members. 
And the social worker testified she had done background research into that family before placing those children. And she had seen or found nothing Mm -hmm. that would indicate Janie was not mentally stable during that time. And so to answer that question, yeah, there's nothing there. She said in all of her interviews with her, she there was just nothing that made her even hesitate to place those two foster children with them. Okay. One other issue that the jury room had that almost made them have a hung jury, but finally they were able to come to a consensus, was one juror was holding out. They just did not believe that someone could take the lives of five family members if they were not mentally ill. You would think, but... Yeah, and I think that's where there is a difference between being mentally ill and insane. Yes. I think if you're, I mean, if you're killing folks, you're probably got some mental illness going on. Right. Regardless. But that, yeah, like you said, that's not the same as criminally insane. Right. Because you can still know right from wrong and be doing those things. Yeah. And the thing is, is that some people, I mean, to begin with, uh, you know, I don't know, like, wh- why she murdered her first victim, her husband. I don't know, you know, what the motive was. Apparently, it wasn't money because, because she didn't have, there wasn't much there. That but policy people, was only $1,000. Like, I have, um, I, you know, after researching plenty of murders, some people just, they have this, I think it's the devil, but they have this, they just want to kill. Right. They want to kill. They're serial killers. They get pleasure out of it's like a power thing yeah and she she actually may could have stopped before he died because while he was in the hospital she was accused later of bringing him soup that had arsenic in it while he was in the hospital with the illness and the fact that she just kept on going and kept Kept on going going, that is i mean that's serial that's that's what serial she was a serial killer five within two years yeah and not just five strangers five of your family members family members unless she was addicted to um sympathy who knows? Some people... well now she did get yes because her church really rallied around her of course she's she's got them fooled apparently right right there was one story of while she was uh waiting i believe the time period was i believe it was before she went to trial mm-hmm. i'm not positive but there was another chaplain that was coming to visit her and he said that he found her you know very he he stated that she received Christ as her savior while he was visiting her. But I mean, she was a Sunday school teacher. She was right. already in church. I'm like, I'm like, mm. I mean, how do you, and I know people go to church. We all, I mean, I think probably to some degree we're, we're all guilty of this, but how do you go to church, you know, week after week and, you know, sit under sound preaching and teaching and know that you're murdering your family. I know. And I not know. feel like terrified. Right. I don't understand it. They said that she was not, she showed no emotions even right after she was arrested and was being held for it and having the psychiatric evaluation. Like she just had no remorse, no feelings about it whatsoever. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you if she had any remorse, if she ever showed any remorse. Not, not that I could find. So, okay, yeah. I mean, so that's very so- sociopath, psychopath. I don't know. One of those crazy. <laughs> and, but that always brings me back to the question. So, did she have signs of that all that time and nobody saw it? I mean, I think with with those, you can disguise that, I think. Yeah. For a long, you know what I mean? They're very yeah. manipulative and, um, you know, but everything they do, and it sounds like this is true yeah. with her. I was just, um, I watched an interview with a boy that's a sociopath and he's actually in therapy for it, but he was very honest, um, which they're usually not. So right. even the guy that was interviewing him was like, well, how do I know this is true? Because, you know, but some of the stuff he said was interesting because he said, everything I do comes back to me. Hmm. Every friend I make, it has to benefit me. Interesting. Every, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like just every move. And so, it, I mean, it could have been something as simple as she was just tired of taking care of her family. Maybe. 
Yeah. I mean, just like the, okay, just like the guy in our last episode, not the last one, but just like the lol. Yes. I mean, he just needed, he didn't hate his family. There was seemingly no motive. He just... And and that's one what the, the one of the money. Yeah, and that's what they kept saying. Her defense kept saying she has no motive, right? Like, like there was just nothing. But I mean, but I, like it could be a small motive to us. It it could be right. like no, hardly no motive to us. Like you said, she maybe she's addicted to sympathy. Yeah. Well, it did make me think of Velma Barfield. Mm-hmm. Remember, we covered her way back. I think episode four and five, maybe. Uh, did the same thing. Serial killer. I don't want yeah, to be spoiled. Yeah. And then later claim to come to know the Lord. Although the difference here, I think, is that Velma, we know, was addicted to uh, medication. Right. And was fueling that. That fueled her killing. Right. And did show remorse eventually. Yes. And all of that. And in this case... Oh, and and Velma had that horrible upbringing that might have contributed to a lot of her addictive personality problems. But none of that shows up in this story at all. Well, what does show up, though, is just like we said in the in the Lowell Andrews case, apparently she was. uh, Well, maybe I don't know. I'm not for sure about that with the Lowell, Lowell Andrews. I shouldn't say that. But with this lady, we know that she was doted on. Mm hmm according to her siblings. And she was probably brought up to think she was the most special, important thing in the world. And that doesn't do that. Doesn't that's not good yeah. for kids to, and, to and think he, that way. Even her brother, he really stood up for her and said that when she was, when she got those sentences, uh-huh. he said, the only way that could happen is, and I'm very loosely paraphrasing. This is not a direct quote because mm-hmm. I didn't write it down, but I did read that. He said, Uh, Only if you just ignored all the evidence could you have found her guilty. So he was taking her side. So maybe she was doted on by all of them. All of them. Who knows? Especially if she was a younger um, sibling. Yeah. And 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 those people are really great at getting sympathy. Yeah. They are. I mean, that's. That's how they're able to get away with stuff for so long. She she did go to prison uh-huh. after that, and she was not going to be up for parole until 2003. Mm. Uh, by then, she would be 71 years old. Okay. During her years in prison, she attempted parole 17 times and was denied each time. Good. However, in 1999, when she was 66, she was suffering from Parkinson's disease. And she was able to get a medical reprieve. So she was actually released from prison early to the care of her brother. And I read that she spent the last few years of her life confined to a wheelchair and in a nursing home until she died at the age of 77. And that was February 7th, 2010. Wow. I mean, I don't feel sorry for her. I don't either. God. And her brother wound up putting her in a nursing home. He probably couldn't handle her behind. Maybe not. She was probably too demanding. May, yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Golly, those were some hard times. They sure were. Sometimes when my wife looks at me with that special glare in her eye, I think I should go take an arsenic poisoning test. And I'm sure we all have that special someone that can use just a little arsenic in their eggnog. But it's Christmas, and instead of killing them with poison, kill them with kindness and the gift that keeps on giving by having them listen to every episode of Hard Times and True Crimes. Have them download and subscribe and leave a review and tell everybody you know and a few people you don't to check us out. Till next time, goodbye.